Danny, the film you did before this one was uh, Slumdog Millionaire, which was about uh, masses and masses of people. And this is a film essentially about one guy. Well, it, it never, it, we never really thought of it like that, actually. We, we always thought that it was, and it's why we begin the film with all those images of, of people, and it's why we end up with people, because I, I, it always struck me that what was extraordinary about the story is that it's often portrayed, and it obviously has a reputation of the story, as a, a story about heroic individualism. You know, that this extraordinary guy survived on his own. But what we thought about it was that it wasn't really about that. There's that side of it, for sure, and obviously you would never underplay just his fortitude and resilience. But actually, the will to survive is pointless, really, without other people. Emotionally, what the film is about is about what we all share, really, rather than kind of um, anything that an individual represents, in a way. That was always the, my feeling about it, anyway. We had the, the, the privilege of seeing um, the real footage that Aaron shot himself in the canyon. It was incredibly powerful, because you're watching a guy um, who thinks he's going to die. Um, and he turns his camera on once a day. And he sort of loved that camera. He had it, 10 minutes, 8 minutes every day where he could vary his day, do something else. And he's smiling in it and remembering uh, the people he spent time with, the people uh, that he loves and misses, the things he got wrong. And he confronts it with such dignity in those, uh, in the, in those real messages. I admired him for it immensely the first time that we saw it together. Preparing for it was sort of like I had to make this decision not to prepare for it. And in a way, the kind of not stopping to think about what was about to befall me as an adventure was the best thing I could do because I think if on paper I had a list of all the things we needed to do to try and achieve that, I, I might have paralyzed myself with fear. Having that first uh, scout, which was really just about taking in Aaron's journey and seeing the place, and not really thinking about it technically yet, although as the minute you accept a job, you sort of, um, as someone said, you don't, you, you picked up the baby at that point. You can't put it down until you're, you're done. Um, so in the back of my mind, I was canyoneering on that day, thinking, oh my god, how are we going to replicate this? Um, we had to use very, very old school methods, literally a, a measuring tape, a flexible measuring tape, a camera, a pencil, and a pad of paper. At one point, I thought we'd hit the jackpot with the idea that we could bring a LiDAR scanner in there to kind of um, uh, take all the 3D info we needed to then replicate it that way. But that space is so prohibitive and actually quite difficult to get to. The scanning equipment, when it arrived, actually didn't fit in the canyon. But really, it came down to um, eyeballing it getting measurements every uh, at every one foot interval along a sort of 30 foot corridor and um, basically photographing 360 degrees floor to ceiling then coming back to salt lake city to our studio putting 2,000 photographs together and recreating a sort of photo collage a la david hockney you know um, in a room and then drafting from all of these um, bits of information. But we had two sets, and both of them are um, pretty much exactly to scale, with the exception of what we call the action or the vertical set, which was a slight stretch of the fall itself. It's about 12 feet, 11 foot six or something, from where he steps off and then, you know, sort of tumbles down with the rock into into his situation. Um, but that happens, as Danny said, very quickly um, in real time. So we stretched that fall on that vertical set by a few feet just to sort of gain um, a little more time for choreography and, and, and landing on it and, and, and technical reasons of being able to isolate different parts of that fall. Otherwise, it's just sort of um, boring and disappointing a little bit in reality. They were two full units, but separate and equal, which means it's a real nightmare naming them because you can't call them first unit and second unit, and you, nor can you use A unit or B unit because that implies A unit might be slightly more important than B unit. So we call them red unit and blue unit. Um, <laughs> this is blue unit sitting in front of you. <laughs> um, 
this is my first time I did a digital, and um, it was great to do it with uh, Danny and Anthony and learn from them. We use a few camera, a few types of cameras, but we use the the, the, the main ones, uh, seventy eight percent of the movie or something like that. We're done with these cameras called S S I two K Silicon Imaging two K. They uh, they can go into a very very small uh, body, and it, with the cable goes to a recorder, Cinedec recorder, and then we use the thirty five millimeter, the movie cans compact, the new one, uh, with uh, Cook's uh, uncoated lenses. And we used um, the Canon, the D7, for bursts. And I think that's that. And a couple of slow motion cameras as well. Because one of the problems we had was like, how, how can we make sure that with such a static film in one sense, that you keep refreshing the palette? And I thought maybe Enrique and Anthony would bring different styles to it. In fact, that was um, a typically foolish idea of me. Because w as soon as they started working with the actor, they both arrived at this similar style together because it was very organic working with James, I think. And no, our mantra was that this was an action movie where the hero can't move. And that was every day in every way it was an action movie and it was about momentum. Because obviously you have a, a subject who is caught and cannot move uh, beyond his foot space. And yet, obviously, movies are motion pictures. And you thought, how can you create that? that sense of a journey, momentum. And there's, a, there's one of the heart towards grace, but there's also this physical momentum that they created with him, with these small cameras, that they could move with every small movie made. And you could feel an intimacy with him, which is very difficult to get with the big film cameras, obviously. One, one, of, the, one of the key people that can't be here tonight because he's working, which we, we should mention, is our editor, John Harris, uh, who... end of this very innovative process along with Danny had to find a way to keep the story moving forward when there was no one to cut to and found this wonderful grammar which which is there in that in that video message that Danny was talking about uh, where he, we jump him around the screen and we, we we're not cutting away to stuff we're staying we're cutting from James to James but uh, with incredible precision and fluidity and a kind of eloquence to keep the story moving he, he did a wonderful job for us alongside everybody else Uh, Glenn, this, uh, this film is very intimate on, on, on certain levels. You're, you're alone with him, uh, every, every sound is accentuated. Can you tell us how you approach the whole concept? The approach was that, is that as soon as after the front, the madness of the front and like pop video and very ultra loud and we, as soon as he fell into the canyon, he got trapped. We really had to get into his space his, you know, and, and see things and listen to things from his perspective. And um, all his equipment, his, his knife, his, the water, the, the, the backpack, and everything he had would become characters in sound. We built an artificial canyon, and we, we clad it in, in sandstone, and then um, filled it with sand. And then we got, uh, we got about a ton of rock sandstone from an old stonemason I knew, which came from an old uh, station in London. And we, we replicated the, 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 the can with these big boulders because so, we wanted it really, really solid, the whole thing. We did everything, but we did it within that space. The idea was that we were trying to be very true to his predicament, and, and the detail of everything was very important to that. So every tiny little sound that he had in there, every, every tiny movement, movement was, you know, he, he, you heard it from his, his perspective. Because of the noise that was out there was, you know, like silent. Every little thing became a detail. So everything had to be spot on because we didn't want to. You didn't want to be taken away from it. You had to be there with him all the time and, and be, really believe that he was stuck. It's very difficult to talk about music. They say talking about music is like dancing about architecture. It's great but pointless, really. Um, um, but great, so we should. There's a music was recorded some in America, some in Bombay. And then it was all put together in London. And um, so the way we work was very, very different. We never take it seriously. We just joke around, and it just spends every three hours every evening at my London house, and four weeks when we finish the music. The the most important part of the the soundtrack, which is the um, stuff, um, the hand cutting scene. <laughs>
because we had a couple of ideas and we had something on steroids which we used on the bike scene. Danny, you uh, I think everyone here tonight is the one you've collaborated with in, in the past, right, on one film or another. I mean, you, what, what is it about uh, working with the same people over and over again? Does the relationship get better? I think you've done six with Anthony now, in fact. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think these people as mini directors, really, like mini me's, you know, like uh, in Austin Powers, is it? What is it? In Austin Powers, like, like mini me's, which is a sorry, <laughs> but no, but seriously, it's a compliment because. You, obviously, they have a level of skill. They're skilled people who've made many, many films in, in many, many different ways, and you, they have a level of skill and professionalism you expect. But I also want them to be mini-directors. I don't just want them to deliver their own bit. I want them to talk about the film constantly and contribute to the film, you know, different ideas from different sources. And it's, when you get that, you know you're going to get all the credit later as a director. So you... <laughs> It's fantastic, it's win-win, they're nice people to work with, and you get all the credit later, so you, you can't lose really, you know, so um, I do genuinely think of them as mini-directors, and um, to have all those voices pulling towards the film, um, pulling for the film is a wonderful thing.